What's going on guys, it's Bromley. I'm coming back to you with a whiteboard presentation. It's been a while since we've done one of these. So I wanted a lot of space to work with and I wanted to have all my cues up so we can keep this thing flowing. Real quick, go ahead and check out the Base Strength Facebook page. I moved our forum onto the Facebook page. A little easier for me to interact and get back to everybody. So I'm trying to get as much bang for my buck. I wanna be able to respond to you, be notified of all the questions and be able to get to them in a timely fashion. So this is a little smoother. So there's a lot of interaction on there. We got a lot of good members already. So go ahead and join that community. Appreciate you. Now the topic at hand today, we're gonna to cover beginner, intermediate and advanced lifters and specifically what that means and what implications that has for their training. But we're also gonna add a little bit of context to it. Surely you've seen a lot of discussion, a lot of different rules, uh, a lot of people postulating what methods are best for what person at a specific phase of training. And I wanna add a little bit of insight because with all of the recommendations you see, and even aside from that, just general training advice you see, it gets very convoluted, a lot of it conflicts, and a lot of it doesn't include when it is supposed to be appropriate or for what type of lifter, or for what type of program. So I wanna add a little insight to that. So breaking down what it is to be a beginner or an intermediate or an advanced lifter, let's just say for a squat, for an average young male, this is about where I was, let's say in high school, very untrained, sedentary. In fact, this is probably generous, 150 pound squat. I think I would have been lucky as a 200 pound 16 year old. Taking this all the way up to something like a 700 pound squat, which is obviously competitive. Uh, it's not necessarily a world record number, but it's something that obviously sets you apart from not just the rest of of humanity, but from the rest of the lifters that you associate with. Everybody recognizes that as requiring a lot of skill, a lot of time, a lot of practice. So the differences between these lifters, it's not just the number on the bar. And you can actually find these traits to try and identify where a lifter is, regardless of where the numbers are. There are smaller lifters who might be very, very advanced at something like a 500 pound squat. And there are people who are very low skilled, who just by virtue of being very large or very big or having a lot of mass, might be on the other end of that 700 pound squat and still have a lot of newbie or intermediate traits. So you wanna look at that specifically. Don't get too hung up on exactly what the numbers are. But when you're new, you're low skilled, you're untrained, capacity is low, coordination's low, you're not comfortable with the movement, and most importantly, you have low mass. That's the one thing I point to the most with new lifters because it is the one that is holding you back the most and is the absolute quickest to fix. Muscle growth in the beginning is just exponential. Again, because homeostasis is much higher, should be much higher than where it is, so getting up to normal. It's similar to if you're very underweight. If you're 70 pounds and you're five foot 10, that means you're malnourished. Eating just a basic amount of food is going to rocket you back up to something like a normal baseline. So you can think of us as being kind of physically malnourished. So if we get a normal amount of work, we all improve very, very quickly. So that's important work. For newbies, everything works. And we have this broad variety of different training systems and they all work. They will all get you stronger, all add mass, especially for the new lifter. So that's important to know. As long as there's effort and as long as there's consistency, just about everything works. Getting into the intermediate, now you're talking about more skill, more time under the bar you're trained, you have a lot more mass as an intermediate than when you started. Uh, now there's implications for recovery. Newbies recover a bit faster. Now that's a little counterintuitive. Yeah, you might be sore, you might be beaten down a little more if you're not conditioned to the workload. But in a broader sense, you can do heavier attempts a lot more closer together. If your max squat is 200 pounds, you can do a 200 pound squat many times throughout the week. You can train with high effort many times throughout the week. And it's not detrimental. In fact, it might even help with your rate of growth. As you get to a 700, 800 pound, 900 pound squat, you can't do normal working sets, sets that are challenging enough to elicit a growth response. You can't do those as consistently. You have to spread them apart. You have to move uh, hard efforts farther apart. You have to control for recovery. So the trend is easier recovery with uh, newbies, much, much lower recovery ability with more advanced, stronger athletes. You have to be much more aware of how you put those hard attempts throughout your workout. But by this point, you have the highest level of skill, you're very highly trained, and you have a lot of mass. You have a lot of muscle mass. None of those things are obviously lacking. You're well-rounded in those areas, and you're pretty topped out. So looking at this dynamic, you want to think about what different 
schools of thought are there? What different programming methodologies are there that you can align yourself to? And how are they going to have implications? How are the implications going to change depending on where you are in your training career? So I broadly separate them into two groups. And there's probably a lot of different ways to categorize training. But I think broadly of narrow and broad. Narrow is focused, it's specific. You're using the main movements as the developmental tool. You're using, in this case, squatting, benching, deadlifting as the thing that grows you. So it's very focused in that sense. So it's greater emphasis on skill, technique, practice. Uh, it's sub-maximal because if you're, you can't practice if you're going all out. You have to keep the weights manageable to refine your technique. So it's sub-maximal. Fatigue is a lot lower. Frequency tends to be a lot higher. So this is where you see whole body workouts, squatting, benching, deadlifting in the same workout multiple times per week. On the other hand, we have broader, more physical development type programs that are more focused on building mass. Now I differentiate between kind of Eastern and Western programs because the, these narrow methods are very often derived from Olympic lifting and that came out of the Soviet era, 60s, 70s, 80s, where they just took a ton of data from their elite lifters and turned it into a science. It was a more formal approach to training. And they also applied that to sprinters and swimmers and everybody else. Where in the West, our strength culture was derived from bodybuilding. Bodybuilding became big first, had a big cultural impact. And then in the 60s, powerlifting became, I think 1965 was the first powerlifting meet. By that time, bodybuilding culture was already cemented. The powerlifters trained like bodybuilders. They did the same thing. They grew their shoulders and chest to get their bench bigger. They grew their quads to get their squat bigger. And then they started to implement more specific tactics as the sport grew and as time went on. But powerlifting in the, in the States was very, very influenced by bodybuilding. So we have these different methods of applying a training stress to try and get a result. So with bodybuilding is pretty straightforward. Everybody knows you have chest day, leg day, back day. Uh, or you might even blend days, but you're focusing on individual muscle groups doing a lot of movement. So it's a lot more varied. You're doing many exercises. Limit. It's taking a limit. That's a big thing. You can differentiate here between submax work and limit work. Limit meaning you're going as hard as you can, whether it's working up to a one rep max or whether it's doing the heaviest set of 10 you can, going to failure, going to beyond failure. Fatigue is high and it stays high. That's pretty consistent with these types of programs. So bodybuilding training. You're not really worried about prioritizing the heavy lifts. You're not really worried about prioritizing strength. You just want the muscle to grow. So you do a lot of exercises. You might pre-fatigue with flies before you bench. Uh, you might you know, go down the list of isolation work or machine work and then go back to the compound lifts. There's a lot of variety. And all that variety is good for uh, preventing diminished returns or stagnation. And it's also good for growth because limit work, training to failure, causing that exhaustion, is a very powerful trigger for muscle growth. There's a lot of different triggers for growth. Working to a limit is one of them. It's the most easiest, and it's why a lot of people bias to that early on. But remember, recovery is high when you're newer. As recovery gets lower, as you get stronger, just going as hard as you can doesn't quite work the same way. Now, as powerlifting became uh, more popular and more easily accessible in the States, it started to evolve. So you have you might think of it as power building. I think of it as old school powerlifting, the type of training that gave rise to the Bill Kazmaier's and the Doug Young's and even the Ed Cohen's. It's not just for the 330 pound mass monsters. Some of the smaller guys, the 198s and 220s, uh, Cohen trained like this and he would talk about all the accessory, building a suit of armor. Every bit of muscle he gained made him more resilient, more resistant to the effects of training. Gave her, uh, gave him a bigger margin so that he, uh, let's say, had more play in the joints or he had a bigger margin for error to control a very, very heavy attempt. And I think that's a very valid way of looking at it. So even the smaller guys, you have to reinforce yourself. Benching alone doesn't build big rear delts. Benching alone doesn't build big lats. You have to do other things to build the fundamental accessories that are uh, required when you're firing on all cylinders. So the benefit of this is the extra variety. It builds muscle. Uh, it's broad, so you avoid diminished returns. It can help you become well-rounded, and it prevents weaknesses. You get a more efficient machine because you're unlikely to get weaknesses if you're training appropriately. So old-school lifting would start with like a heavy progression for the main lift, maybe an accessory, and then would go into lighter, more high-volume, fatigue-oriented bodybuilding work. So it's kind of marrying those two things. Going over here to what we might think of as more specific work, more narrow work, we have something like Eastern templates, formal templates, Olympic inspired templates, which we're starting to see a lot more of now. And that's basically high frequency, again, using it 
uh, using the main movements as skill and getting a lot of practices throughout the week. Um, we tend to see, uh, let's again, a lot of sub max work and we tend to see working in the same range for a long period of time. So this is from a Shaco template and we see a squat, a bench, a squat. He uses variations here and there, but they're very close to the main movement. Over here at deadlift, a bench at deadlift, he's kind of known for that type of pattern. And throughout the week, you're doing whole body, getting a lot of touches, working within a very narrow band. And you might look through four weeks of training and see these same percentages and uh, little adjustments of, of volume being applied. So with that, it really is the changes in volume that drive the progress. It's not going as hard as you can. It's not constantly switching it up. It's exposing yourself to a stress in a very specific range, getting comfortable and skilled in that range, and then slowly ticking up the amount of work you're doing. It's almost akin to step loading in a sense. Step loading in its pure form is just doing the same weight for a certain amount of sets and reps and just either increasing a set or increasing a rep the next time. So the weight doesn't change, just how much work you're doing with that weight changes as you adapt to it and build skill with it. So it's principally kind of the same. Now this type of work is very valid, it's very useful. In principle, it's very easy and straightforward to understand. In practice, it gets more convoluted. These types of methods require paying attention to the math, paying attention to tonnage, it gets a little trickier to pay attention to recovery. You have to have somebody that knows what they're doing. And the templates might be good introduction to that, but once you start to outgrow that, you might need a, an educated set of eyes on your program to keep you moving forward. Now, what's a little more straightforward, more universal, I have starting strength as an example, westernized, uh, narrow, what I would call more specific methods of training that have less exercises. So again, you're not doing a million exercises that are more frequent. We see this with a lot of linear progression. Starting strength is a good example, Texas method, uh, they have a basic strength progression. It's usually do a set of work and just add five pounds uh, every session you do it and you get a lot of touches. So in starting strength, you're squatting multiple times per week. I don't know if this is actually the starting strength split, but this is a very common linear progression split. Uh, squatting and benching, deadlifting and overhead, repeat. Something to that effect. You're working in a very narrow range. It's fives, again, a strength specific rep range. You're not gonna see a lot of eights, tens, twelves in these types of programs. Uh, specific in the movement, specific in the range, sub-maximal, and you're using changes in volume. So starting strength, adding five reps, yeah, or sorry, adding five pounds, yeah, it increases the intensity. But if you keep the uh, sets and reps static, you're also tacking, uh, if you keep the sets and reps static, you're also ticking up the amount of volume too. So the range stays the same. You're just steadily improving your efforts over time. So all of this is a lot more narrow. It doesn't rely on accessory. It doesn't rely on variety. So understanding how these are separate from each other is going to be huge when you're trying to consider what bits of advice you come across or what principles should get applied to your training or are going to be meaningful to your training when you are trying to move forward. So going back to our dynamic over here of this beginner, intermediate, or advanced squatter, how you tick forward, let's say as you transition from beginner to intermediate, could be very different from the old school power builder than it's going to be from somebody who's working in the starting strength verse. Uh, the practical programming verse, as I call it, which encompasses starting strength, the Texas method bleeds into what a lot of Andy Baker does with heavy, medium, light, or what Barbell Logic does. Their whole premise is stick with the main lifts or whatever close variations of them you're going to incorporate. Keep the amount of, of practice high, limit the amount of, of isolation or accessory, and let the strength progression drive progress. And their strength progression is trying to arrange training so you can add that five pounds. It is the, the heaviest weight you've ever done. Usually it's for them for a set of five. So if you're new, remember new lifters, high recovery. You can do that three days a week with a squat or a press. As you get intermediate, you can't do that. That hardest effort you've ever done has to be pushed off. So the Texas method, it'll undulate throughout the week in a kind of a substantial workout, a medium workout, a light workout but those workouts tick up five pounds every week. So now you're on a weekly increase. And then as you get more advanced, it might go every other week, every three weeks. Five, three, one follows a similar pattern, right? Where it's every three weeks, the intensity increases. And then there's a point where you have to reset. So that heaviest workout only comes every three weeks. And that's one of the reasons that that uh, is applicable to a lot of lifters because newbies will get better because they respond to everything. And intermediates will get better because you have enough recovery where you're not gonna burn yourself out just trying to eke out that uh, five pound jump every few days. So that's a hallmark of those linear progressions as you get more advanced, moving those hard efforts further apart because 
That's how the recovery curve works. With the formal stuff, uh, then you have to pay a lot more attention to the specific exercises you're including, to how you change frequency. And again, that's a lot harder to run and that's where you don't wanna have to leave it up to trial and error. That's where you want a trained set of eyes. So I highly recommend if you're going to go that route, get a coach. There are not a lot of people, and I count myself in this category, that have a really good handle of how to handle those more formal, more nuanced methods of training. Now, regardless, you can look at what you need to prioritize and it can give you some insight. So the newer lifters, you're gonna pr uh, prioritize familiarity with compounds because skill is low and you can get that pretty quick. It doesn't take a long time for somebody to get down a passable squat, bench, or deadlift uh, for most people, you know, barring special circumstances. Adding mass, remember that's a big one. Now this is one of the reasons why I always push people into this type of template first. I like starting strength if I'm strapped for time and I need to give somebody a recommendation because it's idiot proof. Simplicity is very important when you're new because simplicity means that there is going to be compliance. The best program in the world doesn't mean dick if somebody is not going to follow it the way it's written. That's true for nutrition. We don't give really complicated nutrition plans to people that just wanna lose a little bit of weight. We simplify it because it means that compliance is going to be high. So I like linear progression starting strength for that reason. But if we have more than five minutes to cover the details of a program, I prefer something that has more accessory because when you're new, you want to take the opportunity to build mass as fast as possible. This is a much faster way. Using limit to your advantage is easier when you're newer. It gets harder as you get more advanced. But when you're new, you can use a bodybuilding method. You can do a lot of different exercises. You can round yourself out. So that by the time you are intermediate, you're more efficient. You're not likely to have a lagging weak point because you spent equal time on let's say tricep and rear delt development as you have actually bench pressing and that's huge that's really important uh so i prefer this for much newer lifters adding mass is one of the easiest fixes you can do if you're trying to get strong quick you just got to eat and you got to train and you got to train hard uh well-rounded development like i covered that that goes hand in hand with adding mass now as we get kind of strong and we have our sights set on a competition on ticking up to that point where we are recognized as a threat, where now we wanna take somebody's lunch money at a powerlifting meet. So now we have a little more time under the bar, less things work. That's important to know. A lot of things still work for intermediate lifters, but less of them work. What you do now is more relevant, uh, sorry, what you do now is gonna be much more determined based on what you did before. So this entire background of training is going to determine what your next step should be. If all you've been doing is bodybuilding training, you're gonna have a much harder time accelerating through and finding those new strength levels because specificity is gonna be lost. If you're training for bodybuilding, that's gonna make you more and more and more focused on bodybuilding type goals, which take into their extreme work, not work against, but take you away from powerlifting specific goals. So it is much harder to use wildly varied training to get to a very, very high level. You have to focus if you wanna be competitive. So less things work, you have to be more specific, you have to spend more time with practice, in which case you're going to be better off doing things that might have more frequency, that might be more based around the main list. You have this nice base of size and strength, you're well-rounded, your capacity is good. And you might take that and funnel that into something that's more specific. Uh, you're gonna want to identify weaknesses. Now, as you do this weakness identification, it's gonna be more focused. Your accessory should be more focused towards things you know are lagging rather than to just general building for the sake of it. So identifying weaknesses is gonna be a bigger deal as your deadlift climbs up. You know, do you have trouble maintaining position? Do your legs strong, but your back goes? Or is it vice versa? You know, do your hamstrings need more love because you became very quad dominant? There's a lot of questions you can ask and if you get good at isolating those things, you can use this background, this broad isolation bodybuilding style background to effectively pinpoint those, uh, those pieces to give more attention to lagging areas. Uh, and controlling for recovery, that's going to be a thing. Remember, less things work. And in order to get the training you do to work, you have to manage recovery, which means, again, moving those hard efforts further apart, understanding that you can't just go as hard as you can on the main lifts as you become an intermediate. Now, eventually, we're down to advanced lifters. The benefit of being an advanced lifter is you know what works for you so far. There's just subtle tweaks you have to make to keep it going. The big tweak is extreme specificity, which means most of your training. 
is going to be oriented towards this skill. Now, when you see that advanced lifters are high skill, you might think, with, well, intuitively, okay, I don't need to focus on high skill. I'm already high skilled. The problem is that when you're operating on this level, when you're redlining it there, you can't afford to lose skill, which means the time you spend away from skill has to be very short. So you have less time, much tighter training cycles. An advanced lifter, they're not going to take, you know, five months to do a lot of bodybuilding pump work. They're not going to spend that much time away because they would detrain, they would lose too much skill. So you might see a couple weeks of some type of lighter hyper, uh, hypertrophy work to clear out, but all in all, most of the training is gonna be in a, a much more narrow band of percentage-based work. Most of it is going to be oriented around maintaining and building skill in the main lift. Um, narrow band of recovery, that's a big one. And by that time, you'll know different lifts affect people differently. So by the time you're advanced, you know that, hey, I can get away with more with, let's say, my squat than my deadlift or vice versa. And that's something you'll learn through experience. But the things that are difficult to recover from have to be taken seriously. You have to be aggressive with uh, allowing enough recovery, taking deloads, making sure that you're manipulating the percentages to keep that growth going up. And a lot of people, as they get intermediate and they start to get competitive, they fall short because they fail to allow for that extra bit of recovery that is necessary. So in general, this whole pattern that you're going to see goes from very broad to very narrow. When you're new, you wanna do all the work, you wanna do all the reps, you wanna do all the exercises, you wanna turn yourself into a poor man's bodybuilder. That's what you're looking for. Build skill in the main movements, but follow that skill work up with as many exercises as you can. Once you get intermediate, now we're on a more narrow band here. We're cutting away a lot of the fluff. We might not be so inclined to do sets of 15 and 20. Less time spent on you know single arm extensions, more time spent on compound movements and specifically chosen uh, variants that are going to fix some weaknesses that we're starting to see pop up. It's not gonna be until you're an intermediate that you even see those weaknesses, I promise you. If you're a novice lifter, the word weakness should not come into your lexicon. Everything is weak. It's only once your lifts start to rise above homeostasis that you can really pinpoint what those weak links are going to look like. And then finally, we finish all here, and this is where you're walking a very tight rope as you try to look onto record level territory. You have to be ultimately specific and you have to be very, very precise with how you apply stress and what that stress looks like and what the timing of that stress looks like. So a lot more questions to be answered. Now, fortunately for you, most of you are going to be in this range. I would think all of you are going to be in this range. So you have an easier time about it. You got plenty of time to figure out what to do. Right now, you got to focus on where you are, make sure you're applying that appropriately. Now, this is a broader kind of macro scale over many, many years of what most of the blocks of your training should look like anyways, because on a short term, if you're looking at over a period of a year or even over a period of a 12 week training block, you're looking at broad hypertrophy work, more focused strength work, and then finally a peak that is ultimately specific and has the greatest amount of recovery. So those principles are shown are revealed on the short term, on the medium term, and the long term. And that's the important thing to know no matter what you're doing. So pick your poison. My best advice, honestly, aside from my recommendations, emphasize what you like to do. If you don't like just doing the same three lifts over and over, don't force yourself to do a hyper uh, specific type of program early on. And I think a big problem with newbies is that they do ignore a lot of this and they do try to get too specific too quick before you even have a base to build that peak off of. So I think that's a big problem. Also, if you don't like doing endless pump work, if you're not a guy that likes you know, doing curls and looking at your arms, if you don't like the feeling of rest pause or drop sets, then don't force yourself to do that either. Find some more hybrid middle of the road program that's going to uh, be more enjoyable because you will be more likely to uh, follow through to be consistent if you organize your training based on what you like and what you are likely to do. So. I think that covers all of it. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. You can leave it in the comment box and I encourage you to. I really recommend you take it to the base strength forum because you will get a much thorough discussion and there tends to be a lot less fuckery than uh, the YouTube comment section can offer. So if you want some in-depth discussion, please take this to the YouTube. Sorry, if you want more in-depth discussion, please take this to the Facebook group page, the base strength page. I'll see you guys there. Thanks for watching. Until next time, this is Bromley. 
I'll see ya.